Pulmonary Surfactant by Hyla Torres. Today's topic is reviewing parts of the respiratory system unit. Breathing is a major part of our everyday life, yet it is often overlooked in our day-to-day -day tasks. Often, when we are stressed, we may hear, take a deep breath. In yoga and meditation, a huge part of the class will focus on breathing. I often take this for granted myself. When I'm sick and congested and thinking back on all the days that I took for granted being able to freely breathe in and out of my clear nostrils. The respiratory system is a constant exchange of ATP synthesis, which requires oxygen and producing carbon dioxide, a constant give and take. We are building this concept from our last unit, the cardiovascular system. Tissues and organs throughout the body need to be oxygenated. Considering these two systems together is referred to as the cardiopulmonary system. Think back to everything that we learned in our last unit and, and see what you can build off from there. The part of the respiratory system we are deeply discussing today is the role of pulmonary surfactant. We will learn what it is, how it helps us, and a real life application. Let's dive into the anatomical features of the lungs. There are two lungs in the human body. The left lung consists of two lobes, and the right lung has three lobes. Many people imagine the lungs as being identical to each other, but that is not the case. Even at a glance, just looking at an image of lungs, you would imagine that they're very similar in size, but you can even see on this image that there is a slight difference. Incoming air enters in and divides up into the bronchi of each lung. These bronchi branch out into what are called bronchioles, smaller branches of bronchi. Each bronchiole is capped at the end with little sacs of air called alveoli. In appearance, they look like little grape clusters. This is where the oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange occurs. The incoming oxygen enters the bloodstream while the carbon dioxide exits and ultimately leaves the body during exhalation. The alveolus is a pouch-like structure and they are covered with squamous alveolar cells on the surface. A small amount of gray alveolar cells also covers the surface. The gray alveolar cells have two functions, to repair alveolar epithelium when they are damaged, and the second is to secrete pulmonary surfactant. It was in the early 1920s when a scientist named von Niergaard first discovered surfactant's elasticity and ability to reduce surface tension in the lungs. His discovery was not nearly as appreciated at the time as it should have been. It wasn't until later on in the 50s that Clements and Paddle rediscovered the abilities that surfactant has on reduction of surface tension at the respiratory level. Not many years later, research was further studied by Avery and Mead. These two were able to be the forefront of further exploration after seeing a direct correlation of infants lacking surfactant that had respiratory distress syndrome. At the time was a big killer of infants. There was still much for them to learn about all the components at a cellular level, but the major evidence was clear to them that there was a correlation between lack of surfactant and dying infants. Pulmonary, pulmonary surfactant is what coats the smallest bronchioles and alveoli. It is made of a mixture of proteins and phospholipids and an incredibly minute amount of carbohydrates. Technically speaking, it is composed of a film of dipalmatol phosphatidylcholine, also known as DPPC, which is a type of phospholipid. Other parts of surfactant are lipids called triglycerides and phosphatidylglycerol also called PG. 
These proteins associated with composing surfactant are called specific surfactant proteins, SPA, SPV, SPC, and SPD. Although they are all in the category of specific surfactant proteins, they are slightly different. For example, SPA and SPD are glycoproteins and are hydrophilic, which means they can dissolve with water and they attract water molecules. SPC and SPB, on the other hand, are hydrophobic, mean that they will repel water molecules and cannot dissolve in water. There are also calcium ions present in surfactant. It aids in reducing surface tension and preventing alveoli sacs from collapsing during exhalation. This is a big part of what we're gonna be talking about today. If surfactant was not a part of this anatomical structure, deflating alveolus would stick to each other and it would be nearly impossible to reinflate. You can see and appreciate how the discovery of infants lacking surfactant was such a big thing because when you think about it, when a baby is first born, they are super, well, this is debatable, but they're, they're strong, but they're weak in a sense, or they're just learning how to breathe. So they don't really have the strength in them to push and breathe and breathe as hard as they can. So if they're lacking, if they're lacking that surfactant, that is why there is such a high mortality rate. It is increasingly difficult for them. So they really need that surfactant level to be there so that it can help them with the breathing and reinflation of those alveolar sacs. The surfactant is found among the water and air interface. Additionally, pulmonary surfactant protects the lungs from various incoming pathological invaders. For example, if someone breathes in particles in the air that have the ability to cause micro tears, surfactant is a protector against that. Inhalation of harmful particles or immunocompromising microorganisms are fought off by the structure of surfactant. The hydrophilic SPA and SPD play a role in destroying the viruses by what is known as opsonization, which is kind of a phagotizing action, it sort of eats it up. So here we have this image. As previously mentioned, the composition of surfactant contains various proteins, lipids, and phospholipids. It has been studied um, with various animal species. Surfactants were used clinically and experimentally. The types of animals and its components are listed in the table here. You can see Homo sapiens for the humans, that one's towards the bottom, mice, rats, rabbits, sheep, and different bovine species. It's interesting to see the similarities and the differences between the species. So take a look at this, see what type of conclusions you can draw, and what raises questions for you. We have briefly mentioned how surfactant was first discovered as well as some recent advances. So what does this mean for our future? What techniques are we currently applying to make the future of respiratory disorders more clear? Though we have already discovered surfactant, there is still much to learn. Electron spray mass spectrometers have the ability to tell researchers the type of lipids it contains. Also, there are various abilities to use microscopes and continuing to identify histological entities of surfactant. Spectroscopic techniques allow scientists to find lipid-to-lipid -lipid and lipid-to-protein communications at the cellular and molecular level. In studying non-mammalian forms of surfactant, it was actually found in some unusual organs in several types of fish, specifically in their bladder. This perhaps is not too far-fetched, as it has been predicted by evolutionary scientists that the swim bladders of fish have actually evolved from their lungs. So why would surfactant be in those organs though? Perhaps the inflation and deflation in these aquatic species function best with the aid of surfactant. It's still being studied, but I thought it'd be interesting to mention.
Finally, I do want to briefly mention the role of surfactant in cystic fibrosis. This is an inflammatory, a chronic inflammatory disorder that one of my close friends has and it really doing this presentation brought me to thinking a lot about um, what he has going on in his body. It's inflammatory as I mentioned so there's a lot of mucus, extra mucus that is formed in CF or cystic fibrosis patients. Um, it can affect the body in numerous ways, as I mentioned, including the airflow and breathing, just like seen in this image. The study hypothesized that CF patients would have impaired biochemical properties in their surfactant. This was in a 1997 study. Those afflicted with cystic fibrosis showed high levels of polymo polymorphonuclear cell counts of the neutrophil kind compared to the control group that does not have cystic fibrosis. The total count of proteins and phospholipids remained relatively the same, however. I couldn't really find anything recent after this 1997 study, and I know that there has probably been some advances since then, but it's pretty interesting to think back about how that was not too long ago and see where their hypothesis falls. So. I hope this presentation gave you some more things to think about, something that we take for granted so often, our breathing. It's something that we do almost automatically, and half the time we have to really think about it when we want to slow down or speed up our breathing. So take a consideration of this. Think about how it relates to our last unit, and thank you for your time.